Today's presentation is on the glandular system. Glandular system I've got um, listed down here. Starts at the pineal gland in the top of the head. We'll go through the body and we'll end up down at the gonadal sexual part of the glandular system. It may seem that these are, to most people, the order of priority seems to be down here. However, they're actually in their order in the body of priority. Top of the head, pineal gland. If you were to take two fingers, and go through about the middle of your head this way, come down from here, come down in there, right in the top of your brain is the pineal gland. You'll notice how close it is to the skull here. It's been referred to as the third eye. In fact, in birds, this gland is slightly more forward and the skull is a little thinner. And they have actually been proven to use the pineal gland as a form of eyesight. There's been some experiments done where they'll physically blind with some patches birds and put them out to fly in the daylight. And they can navigate just as well through the trees and so forth by using the different shadings of light and dark that the pineal gland receives. What the pineal gland does for us is put us in tune with the light and dark cycles. It wakes us up in the morning. It begins to put us to sleep at night. It came into popularity probably a little over 10, 15 years ago now with people with jet lag flying around the world. The, especially the airline people would find out that they run behind the clock, ahead of the clock. Their sleep cycles get all out of order. The pineal gland is the gland that affects that. So there was a lot of research done. They were able to isolate the hormonal product, melatonin, which we'll talk about when we get to the herbal side. This gland puts out the melatonin, begins to, late in the day as the sun's going down, it senses that and puts us in the sleep cycle. Daytime, as it's becoming daylight, it begins to shut off and the melatonin in your body drops back to very low levels, if not existent, and it begins to wake you up. There's a lot more to it than that. Research indicates that the pineal gland is the leader of the band all the way through this system. Some years ago, they used to think it was a pituitary because it has a tremendous amount of direct function here, which we'll cover in a moment. But the pineal gland actually gently stimulates and keeps active and healthy all these other glands through the body. Some of the problems that happen with the pineal gland, it seems to age. And when they do the autopsies and get into the research, they find out that it has actually calcified, becomes crystalline with calcification. Now, my understanding of the way the body works, and, and we'll, we cover this in many of our sessions, is that this body must remain alkaline. And when the body becomes acidic, calcium cannot go into the glands and into the bone where it's supposed to go, and it begins to build up in tissue. So some of the research indicates that when the body's acidic, it contributes to the calcification of your pineal gland. When the pineal gland begins to calcify and weaken in the efforts that it has over these other glands, that's part of the aging process. A lot of research indicates that if the pineal gland is kept healthy or at least the hormone balanced, the aging process is slowed down, stopped, and in some cases even reversed. There's been several good experiments where they've taken, for example, the pineal gland out of a rat that appeared to be 60, 70 years old in relation to a human year, and he's all gray and shriveled. And then they'll take a nice, young, healthy little rat, and they surgically switch the pineal glands. And within a reasonably short period of time, several weeks, months, somewhere in there, the physical characteristics of the two rats switch. The young rat begins to look very, very old. The old rat begins to look very, very young. There is some definite literature in enforcing that information. So we don't necessarily use work on the pineal gland as a fountain of youth, but keeping it healthy is certainly valuable. The hormone that's put out here, melatonin, seems to peak in our bodies, reference to age, at about 20 years old. And then it begins to taper off. So to maintain a healthy system, it would be a good idea, perhaps, to supplement. Stay alkaline to prevent some of the aging process, but to supplement just a little bit with the melatonin. 
Melatonin can also be used as a sleep aid, and we'll cover more of that when we get on the, on the supplements. But it can be used as a general tune-up for the rest of the system. So keep that in mind. We can also look at the pineal gland as our control of light and day. Remember that part. If you are sleeping in the daytime and you're on some kind of shift work or something and you want to use melatonin as a sleep aid, that's okay. That works fine. There is some degree of caution involved. It's kind of like which came first, chicken or the egg. In prostate cancer in men, for example, and that's probably the only place prostate cancer occurs, but they have found a tremendously high elevated level of melatonin in the bloodstream reference to prostate cancer. Research doesn't indicate the direct connection or why, it just happens to be a common denominator. So what we generally feel is a good idea is to not take melatonin and force yourself to stay awake. Don't have melatonin in what would be for you a daylight time. So if you are going to use melatonin and you're on shift work or something, shut the windows, close the blinds, and go to sleep. If you want to use melatonin as a therapeutic aid to non-aging situation, take it at night when it's supposed to be in your system. Don't say, well, if it's a good vitamin, I'm going to take it during the day. I would highly not recommend that. Use it when it's supposed to be used, and you'll have much greater success with it, and it'll be very safe for you. Well, come on down under the pineal gland to the pituitary. Pituitary is virtually straight back. The bridge of your nose comes up to your eyebrow, goes straight back, kind of at the top of the brain stem a little bit, buried down in the base of the brain. The pituitary gland's function <clears throat> is to send signals, excuse me, <clears throat> to all of these glandular systems, and it actually tells them when to turn on, when to turn off. It's the real working leader of the band, but it is stimulated and kept very viable by the pineal. Pituitary gland begins to stimulate these other glands, tell them it's time to wake up and do something. It's the pituitary gland that begins to turn us in definitely male or female from at, at right after birth. Pituitary gland, as I said, buried back almost on top of the brain stem, right back in this area here. Some of the things it can affect are anything in this area. Anything, for example, if you have an extremely difficult sinus drainage situation and it doesn't appear to be an infective nature, just have this real aggravating constant drainage, I would look at the pituitary gland for a weakness. If your hormonal system is out of balance, male-female hormonal system, I might look at strengthening the pituitary gland. Remember that it does lead the band here. We'll come on down a little bit to the thyroid. Attached to the is a thyroid is a parathyroid. Thyroid is right here on either side of your neck. I remember when I was a boy, it used to scare me. I'd see some folks walking around with these large lumps on their neck, and my mom would explain to me that that was goiter and that it was from thyroid problems, and it would occur with a lack of iodine in the diet. The thyroid's main function is to most of us understand that it runs our metabolism. Now, it does a whole lot more than that. It also runs, helps regulate heart rate. It can, has a lot of effect in the adrenal system and in the hormonal system, male-female. The thyroid can also go in the other direction as far as metabolism can speed it up, can slow it down. There's an awful lot of work being done by the thyroid. I'm going to go back to the goiter thing for a second. The main food of the thyroid is iodine. And back in the 40s, early 40s to middle, it became very apparent that the soils, especially across the middle of our country, were depleted of iodine, and all this goiter started to develop. It, it began in the late 30s. And it became very apparent that there was this iodine problem, so they came up with iodized salt, because everybody was eating tons of salt on everything. So goiter disappeared. Well, that was okay for a short period of time because about 10 years later, maybe 15, you know, heart disease is on a major climb. And the medical profession determines that part of the problem is salt causing high blood pressure, the extracellular sodium in the body. So they recommend everybody goes on a low-salt diet. 
Well, there goes the iodine again. So the goiter didn't come raging back like it was before. Apparently, there was some balancing going on with iodine and other foods, perhaps. But what I've noticed in some of our associates and, and some of the research out there is a weakening of the thyroid without goiter problems, but just a lot of weakening over the past probably 15 years. What a lot of the information indicates is that things that weaken the thyroid that are in our environment now are the chemically manufactured sweeteners. They poison the thyroid. The major one that's out there, one of its first conversions as it's going through its chemical processes in your body is to convert to wood alcohol, a deadly poison in the body. And that poisons the thyroid. When the chemical sweeteners came out, hypothyroid dramatically increased. And the only reason there's not more attention paid to hypo or low thyroid is that there's no economic drive behind correcting that situation. So it seems to affect the body gradually and slowly and other systems slow down and it's ignored. And yet it's a major problem. I, I, in my own experience, we run into it a lot. So please don't do the artificial sweeteners. I'd rather have your body try and deal with sugar, which we'll talk about a little bit when we get down here. But those chemically manufactured artificial sweeteners, not only do they poison the thyroid, but because of that conversion to wood alcohol, they can seem to weaken the retinas in the eyes. I'm aware of a couple of situations where there's some extensive litigation related to that situation. So the thyroid can be weakened tremendously depending on what we eat, but especially with the artificial sweeteners. Parathyroid. <clears throat> Two little nubs on top of the thyroid. Parathyroid's, parathyroid's function excuse me, is to regulate calcium levels in the blood. It will stimulate your body to take calcium out of the bone, into the blood, from the blood, back into the bone. That's the hormone in here is calcitonin. The parathyroid seems to weaken right along with the thyroid. And its foods seem to be the same thing, the way to nourish it. So if you have a weak thyroid, it is entirely possible that you are also having a little calcium problem. And so maybe the answer to osteoporosis is not so much wrapped up in estrogen as we've been led to believe. There could be a connection in this area also that gets overlooked. Come on down into the body a little further, down under the breastbone here, just below where the tracheal hole is, the thymus. This gland, kind of heart-shaped, maybe about that big, kind of soft and jelly-like right in here, is directly responsible for our immune system. It is stimulated by vibration. Now, I used to think that gorillas did this as a show of anger, but that's not the case. If each of us would stand up in the morning as soon as we get out of bed or sit right on the side of the bed and beat on our thymus for about three minutes, we'd be a lot healthier, we'd be more active, we'd be more alert. It feels wonderful. It's one of the reasons that we like a hug because that vibration of chest contact and a pat on the back is a thymus thump. It makes you feel good. Besides the tactile uh, uh, contact, it's the vibration. It stimulates the thymus. The thymus within the body stimulates the production of your immune system, T cells, T, thymus, out of your bones into the bloodstream in response to an infective nature. Thymus is the immune system. It used to be the one that was considered the aging process. As the thymus turned to jelly in an older person, the immune system would get weak, and therefore they said, well, you're aging. Well, it's the reverse is true. If you'll keep doing this, and probably everybody in class should do this, if you'll do this periodically, every day would be great, you'll keep your thymus activated, tuned up, and we'll talk about some herbals that will do that also. Strong immune system here. Under the thymus, I have the heart. Now, I know if you've just come from a biology class, or an, you won't find the heart listed on anybody else's glandular system but mine. It's been over five years now, I, I, probably six or seven, that the heart was found to give out hormones. It is not just a muscle that pumps blood. There's definite scientific data. There's been an entire organization developed. They go around teaching people. 
that the stimulus of the heart stimulates hormones through the body, and they are primarily happy and sad type of hormones. It is stimulated by visual excitement, by sound, and you become emotionally stimulated by your heart, happy or sad. Now, the interesting thing about these hormones is that general old teachings are that when this gland or this gland put out a hormone from the stimulus of this gland and some visual or some external, then you pump the hormone into the bloodstream and the bloodstream goes, takes it through the body, which would be an extremely slow process. Current research indicates that when this gland says, time to do my job, the minute it starts to do a hormone, every cell in your body produces that hormone. It's like instant. It is faster than the nervous system. So when your heart hears happy music, the minute it begins to produce its hormone, your toes are happy. It's the fastest communication system we have in our body right now, current in research, that the hormone system is the fastest. And it can affect you that fast. I mean, it's not like you see something and you just keep right on walking and about a half hour later you go, oh, wow, uh, I react to that and get happy. That's not it. It's very, very fast. Keep your heart healthy. And I know we go back into the old ancient literature, the old sages and the philosophers. They said, you know, in the heart as a man thinketh, and all that stuff about the heart being the key to our health. They were right. They probably didn't know it from a scientific viewpoint, but they knew they were right. So I have the heart in here as a gland. It's been proven, and it is very important that we not only keep it strong to pump blood and do all the circulation, but we keep it healthy and stimulated with the good stuff. You know, we take a puppy dog into an old folks home and let the people get, you know, pet the dog, pet the cat. I mean, laughter for people is tr tremendously medicinal and healing. So remember that. I'm going to keep it here on the glandular chart. You'll see it again in the circulatory class. Come on down to the adrenals. Adrenals sit on top of the kidneys. Back here, ad, meaning on top of renal kidney. Little tiny, but maybe the size of a walnut. Tremendous amount of responsibility here for the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, most people understand that they're responsible for fight or flight. What that means is that when the lion comes through the door, you've got to respond in some way. And that responsibility comes from the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands begin to step up your heart rate, step up your breathing, start to close down some of your vascular system so that the blood goes to the lungs and the hearts and the muscle so that you can decide whether you want to fight the lion or run, fight or flight. That's their main function. Further on in this fight or flight, the adrenals are responsible for all the valves in your body. If under fear, you've got this lion standing at the door trying to decide whether it's going to eat you or not, the adrenal glands will shut down your colon. They can also control the urinary system. That's all a bunch of valves. So many times when we get into constipation, we get dealing with incontinence, things of that nature. You don't necessarily do all your work within that system. Look at the adrenals. If they're weak, you can have the incontinence, and many times in a very difficult situation of working with constipation. Look at the adrenals. Work on them, those systems work better. Back into the fight or flight. The cortisol that's put out by the adrenal glands is supposed to stimulate all this activity. The activity is in actuality destructive. The body is not supposed to remain in fight or flight. It's, a, it's like driving a car around in first gear. If you did that all the time, you would eventually wear the parts out. But it sure would get you off the line in a hurry. So when you are in this fight or flight, the body is being destroyed slightly. The minute the stressor is removed, you're supposed to go back into relaxed. 
and then the system begins to repair itself. The cortisol is broken down, everything's recycled, the blood system goes back where it belongs, breathing returns to normal. What we do is we read the newspaper at night. We watch the TV early and late. We see all the garbage that's going on, puts us in fight or flight. The problem is we don't fly and we don't fight. We just sit there and we take that stuff and put it in here and we put it in here and the cortisol goes drip, drip, drip and the body tries to go into fight or flight but all it does is go into a destructive situation. We call it stress. But it is destructive if it's not ventilated. One of my mentors that I have read quite a bit, he gives a nice simile here. You take a cat and he sees a bird and he jumps at the bird and he misses it. Well, if the, bird, if the cat were a human being, it would start to analyze that situation and say, oh my gosh, somebody's been you know, chasing the birds, maybe my nails aren't sharp enough, oh my gosh. And that's what we do. What a cat does, if it misses the bird, it just goes, <laughs> sits there, licks itself a little bit, and goes off and looks for another bird. If you cannot directly affect the stressor, do not internalize it. You read the newspaper, you see a headline, something's not right in another part of the world, and you want to do something about it? If you can't get on a plane and go over there and do something about it, I suggest you write a letter to the appropriate people, stick it in the mailbox, and turn the TV off. Don't do that stuff to yourself. Do what you can do, let somebody else do the rest, and you get on with your life. Relax, relieve some of the stress. Adrenal glands get burned out easily. We're a nation in adrenal stress. We'll come on down. Pancreas sits about here in the body. Main function of the pancreas is to deal with sugar metabolism. It is an endocrine exocrine gland, meaning it secretes internal as far as directly into the bloodstream and it secretes external, meaning into a tube or a pipe. The exocrine part we cover in digestion, it makes pancreatin. In this case, it is an endocrine, it is making insulin that goes into the bloodstream. And that helps us metabolize sugar, makes glucose glucogen through that system, whether we store it as fat, whether we use it as energy, that's its main function. It is damaged by sugar. That's the single greatest poison for the pancreas. Now sugar does a lot of other things to the body, but that begins the destruction of the pancreas. And if you're really aware of it, infants in the hospital, the first thing they're given most of the time is sugar water. Their poor little pancreases don't know what to do with that stuff. It just it goes into shock and there's no need for it. If you need to ventilate or wash out an infant's tract, use water. Don't need to use sugar water. That's one reason we have so much diabetes in this country. That immediately sugar shock at that age, and then we're a nation that consumes about 135 pounds of sugar per person. Now, my sugar consumption is fairly low, and maybe some of yours is fairly low, so Let's say I consume 50. Where's the rest of it going? National average is 135 pounds per every person in this country. Some people are eating 200 pounds. Pancreas damage has to happen. Now, sugar also destroys the myelin sheath on your nerves. It weakens your muscles. I mean, there's a lot of other things it does. But the beginning is right here in the pancreas. To have so much diabetes, and diabetes is becoming a younger and younger problem. I believe and I understand that it is directly related to sugar, and yet that's a, it's in everything. If any of you have got a recipe at home for ketchup, that's one little teeny tiny tomato and three cups of sugar. You, know, you can get ketchup that doesn't have that kind of sugar in it, but you're going to have to start looking at labels, and it will scare you so much. If you look at labels to find out where sugar is, and while we're on sugar, it needs... The one I'm talking about that's the most poisonous is the white processed sugar. It doesn't have any minerals in it. It's been processed down to strictly sucrose. On the other end of the scale would be a carrot. 
with a good healthy carrot with a lot of minerals in it. Somewhere in between there, you need to be as close to the carrot in your sugar types as possible. To pick up a candy bar and say, oh, it's in the health food store, it's got fructose in it, it's sugar. It's just not going to hit you as quick, just a little slower. You've got to get minerals, you've got to get fiber, you've got to get some fats. Those things modify the sugar response. So you take the long end of the scale at white processed and then you go down through the fruit and then you get down to the vegetables and to the carrot or beet and that's where we ought to be with sugar. Honey, people say, well, I can use honey. I really wouldn't recommend that a lot. There's some other things we'll talk about in a minute. Honey's not a whole lot better than fructose. It can be a sugar load. It can be real stressful on the pancreas. Used in moderation, it's not too bad. You can do a tremendous amount, keep the system strong, get sugar out of your diet. We'll talk about some herbals, we'll talk about some trace minerals that this gland needs. We're going to come on down, come down to the gonadal, male, female, it would be testicles, would be ovaries here. These little glands are kind of like warehouses. Not 100% factory, more like warehouse. They do some manufacturing, they do an enhancement procedure, and they seem to produce some hormones. But remember what I said back in the beginning, that every cell in your body has the capability of matching a hormone that's going on somewhere else, or when the signal is sent out. When these gonadal glands are removed, why don't people revert back to something that wasn't glandular. Why doesn't a man become a woman? Why doesn't a woman become a man? Go back to childbirth. There's almost nothing here at childbirth. But what is here is the adrenal glands and the thyroid. These two glands tremendously affect the beginning early production and the maintenance of production of the hormones that the gonadals magnify and store. We run into a a lot of information and we've had a lot of experience with people come in, oh, I'm having hot flashes or I'm having early menopause or I'm having this and that. So they've been put on hormone therapy. The problem upon analysis is weak adrenals, weak thyroid. To just do a direct hormonal supplement can never get in balance properly. You've got to go back to the glands that are affecting the production of those hormones. So you can do a tremendous amount for people when they end up in a hormonal imbalance that is obvious, as in the male-female situation, to go back to these other glands and make sure they're strong. Now, hidden in here is the liver. And processed in the liver is cholesterol. And from cholesterol comes these hormones. So, let's put you on a zero cholesterol diet. Don't do that. Another thing that affects hormonal balance is the quality and strength of the liver. It's not here as a gland, but it has a tremendous effect on the male-female system. A weak liver is going to cause a weak hormonal system. A zero cholesterol diet is going to cause some hormonal problems. Women especially, when they become athletes, they go into extreme bodybuilding, will exercise themselves out of the menstrual cycle very, very damaging. We've also had some experience with people who have been on the zero fat diets and there's a couple of practitioners out there who have written some excellent books and, and they're focused on preventing heart disease from getting rid of cholesterol from that approach, zero fat diet. Now I'm not suggesting that you eat the fat on the, on, under the chicken skin or eat, start eating pork chops and wolfing down the fat. That's not what I'm saying. We need the essential fatty acids. We need the fats in vegetables, and we need the fats in, that do occur in whatever meat you might eat, so long as you're eating the lean part of the meat. Some of those are okay. They're pretty good for us, especially the vegetable kind are fantastic. Our experience has been with people on zero fat diets end up with an immune problem, and it seems to always manifest in the skin. If you're working with anybody with extreme psoriasis, eczema, the three I'm very familiar with, are extremely allergic to scabies. Now, I don't know if you've all run into this, but in hospitals today, scabies is a major problem. The little mites that get under your skin. 
and they cause infections and they cause all kinds of irritation and problems. They shouldn't be able to get in there that easy and it's the continuity and strength of the skin related to its prostaglandin immune system, cholesterol, it's all related to this immune system of the skin. So a zero fat diet can destroy the strength of your skin. Highly not recommended by myself and many other people in the natural health field. Okay, we've done from the bottom, we'll go back to the top. Gonads for male, female, basically. Pancreas, sugar, maintenance, sugar usage, sugar processing in the body. Adrenal glands, fight or flight initially, but also directly related to the hormones, male, female. Heart, the happy and sad. Besides pumping blood, it, thymus, the immune system. Parathyroid sitting on top of the thyroids, calcium control in the blood. Thyroid, basic metabolism, up or down. Heart rate, production of hormones, will determine whether you can accelerate and get into the fight or flight. So if you have weak thyroid and you're stressing it further with the adrenals, you've got a mixed set of signals going on in a system that, that's weak extremely out of balance hormonally. Go up here to the pituitary gland, right straight back in from the bridge of the nose. This gland begins the process of telling all these other glands what to do and starts to wake them up very early in our life and then continues to kind of choreograph all this. The pineal gland right up middle of our head, the third eye, keeps the rest of these healthy, obviously regulates our night-day cycle. So we use the pineal gland to adjust sleep cycle with. That's the basics of the glandular system, the different pieces and parts of it, and their locations. Now we're going to talk about some supplementation, some herbals, some things that will be used to work with that system. Right here is melatonin, the pineal gland. This is the hormone that the pineal gland puts out. Remember that it regulates your sleep cycle. Remember also that it helps keep the other glands strong and has an effect on the aging of our bodies. Pituitary and spirulina, T-A-R. Let's put a Y on that. Spirulina would be the food for the pituitary. We'll see spirulina again, um, could bring it also down with the thyroid. Pituitary gland regulates how the other glands begin and stop their processing. But very early on, the pituitary gland, remember, stimulates everything else into starting. Needs to be very strong, needs to be stable. There's a lot of emotional things related to the pituitary gland. Spirulina would be excellent for the pituitary gland. Kelp. Thyroid. The main ingredient in kelp that works with thyroid is iodine. Now there's some other excellent herbals that would work on the thyroid, for example, black walnut. Black walnut is very high in iodine. We would also use that with the thyroid. The sea vegetables, kelp, uh, deep water fish would be excellent for the strength of the thyroid. We'll come on down. Um, I'm going to go back. Kelp, thyroid. There also seems to be a tremendous relationship between thyroid and kelp and tumors. When the thyroid is weak and there's not enough iodine in the system to feed it, we seem to develop fatty tumors and mostly benign, but there's also some connection into malignant tumors. If you have someone in that situation, look at the thyroid. Look at their consumption of iodine and see what it needs. I'm going to put in reference to kelp. I'm going to write it over here for you. Um, bugleweed. Bugleweed would be the herb to use in a hyperthyroid. Not very common. We've got a tremendous amount of hypothyroid. But every once in a while now, we'll get a hyperthyroid. And they're the kind of people that you see perhaps very nervous, 
normally very thin if it's progressed along at all. You can get a racing heart, irregular heart rate. The eyes might start to bulge slightly. Um, very destructive situation. Fugalweed has a very, very calming, soothing effect on the thyroid. It's not going to take someone with a healthy thyroid and shut them down, but it will help stabilize and keep the thyroid normalized. Another thing you might use here nutritionally would be cabbage, for example, and um, cauliflower. Those two vegetables contain what's called goitrogens. Remember I said goiter was a swelling of the thyroid? Cabbage and the um, cauliflower with their goitrogens slow down the thyroid. So a tremendous diet of cabbage. Now I know cabbage can be used therapeutically in certain cases, and I agree with that. But a high cabbage diet tends to produce a person with low thyroid appearance. And it works very well if you're working in hyperthyroid. Another thing that would aggravate the thyroid would be animal protein. Animal protein is extremely stressful on the body. And it can stress the thyroid tremendously. So if we were in hyperthyroid while you're doing this bugleweed, I would also have that person off of animal protein. We're going to come down here. We have echinacea, cat's claw, Oregon grape. These are for the thymus. Echinacea has been around for perhaps centuries, the awareness and use of it. Stimulates the production of T cells within the body and the immune system. Cat's claw is an herb that came out of South America. It's been down there for centuries, but awareness around the world has only been about four or five years. Also called unia de gato. Stimulates the production of white cells, T cells, phagocytes, all of the portions of your bloodstream that respond to an infective nature. Cat's claw is phenomenal for that. It is also an excellent anti-inflammatory. I would use cat's claw in Crohn's and colitis, for example. It helps your body respond to any infection or irritation, but it would be better than any form of a NISAD or an anti-inflammatory of that nature. Cat's claw is a fantastic herb. And by the way, it is not cat's claws. It's the bark of the roots and sometimes bark of the plant on the tree. But it is not cat's claw. Oregon grape. Oregon grape would be stimulating to the immune system, um, very anti-infective. I probably could also write in here golden seal in a sense. I'm only going to do that because you can use golden seal almost as a replacement for Oregon grape. Golden seal does not stimulate the thymus. Don't get that confused here, but it is an anti-infective. It is truly antibacterial, very specific to staph and strep. So you might want to use that in an immune situation. Oregon grape almost matches golden seal, but it doesn't have all of the components, but you can use it as an anti-infective as well as a stimulus for the immune system. Come down a little further, and we've gone to the adrenals. Oh, yes. Okay. I didn't put any herbals in here for the heart. In reference to the glandular part, there's not any research to indicate the best thing for the glandular approach to the heart would be happy. Remove stressors. Don't bring any in. Don't focus on that kind of thing. You know, and get out and smell the roses. You know, pet the cat. Look at the little baby smile. Those are things that are good for the heart glandular-wise. An herb for the heart might be hawthorn. We'll get into more of that when we do circulatory work. Reference to the adrenals, geranium, go to cola, panathenic acid. This geranium, by the way, that I'm referring to is oil. Not necessarily an herb, but the oil, the essential oil of geranium. It helps stimulate the adrenals. Geranium oil also, we'll touch on it again when we get down to the pancreas here. Geranium oil will balance an infection that is related to diabetes. The oils are very powerful. I recommend that everybody begin to start learning more about oils and begin to incorporate them into their system. Go to cola, fantastic herb for the adrenal system. Strengthens it, 
not stimulating necessarily, but very strengthening and stabilizing. Go to coal also kind of gets overlooked. It's a fantastic herb for repairing all the collagen structure in your body. It's been used to repair torn retinas. It's been used in surgery. It will prevent scarring in the body. It, a lot of research indicates that it prevents keloids in the people of black African descent, the dark skin people. You know, when you get a cut and the scar gets lumpy on the outside, that's a keloid. Go to cola will prevent that. Surgery internal prevents adhesions. Happens quite a bit when people have hysterectomies or go in for surgery around the colon and intestinal tract. The body starts to kind of tie itself back together and wherever something touches the lining of the cavity, it will adhere to that and you can get a misshapen situation in there. Go to cola would prevent that. It would be recommended that pre-surgery take rather large amounts of go to cola during and after. Go to cola also will remove cellulite from the body, the deposits of adipose fat that build up on people from little improper nutrition, little lack of activity. Go to cola is excellent for that. In here, it is primarily for the adrenals, but this is a wonderful herb that gets overlooked quite a bit. And we come down to rosemary. Rosemary oil, essential oil. Eucalyptus, oil. Cedarberry, nopal, chromium, and stevia. These are for pancreas. Sneak that up there. There's a little caution with rosemary oil. It can raise blood pressure. So I wouldn't, I, I caution to look for that, look for a high blood pressure situation. Don't use rosemary. But for strengthening and stabilizing the pancreas, rosemary essential oils used topically, used as aromatherapy, would be excellent. Eucalyptus oil works in the same mechanism. Cedarberry, interesting story on cedarberry. It's in a couple of the formulas that we use quite a bit. One of the people that first discovered it, reference to the pancreas, was out picking what they thought was juniper berries. Now juniper berries are diuretic, and that's what they were looking for. They wanted to do some kidney work. They picked the wrong thing. And they started taking the cedarberry and found that in a very short period of time, their need for insulin dropped. So that would appear in a pancreas formula. Nopal, that's a cactus pad. Comes from middle America, Mexico, on down to South America. The nopal cactus pad, a lot of research, a lot of great work with it. People who take nopal routinely for a long period of time, monitor their blood sugar, Nopal strengthens the pancreas, balances it, strengthens the beta cells in your system so you can use insulin properly. So over a period of time, and some everybody's different, you would find if you monitor your sugar that your need for insulin would decrease rapidly and become very stable with the use of Nopal. Chromium is the mineral directly related to the pancreas. If you have a sugar craving, First thing I look at is how much chromium is in your diet. There isn't any chromium in the soil. Sometimes you can buy a carrot and it won't have any chromium in it. Even if it's organic, it just depends on the types of fertilizer that have been used. So chromium would be the simplest thing to start with. Make sure you've got a vitamin with chromium in it or increase the chromium and see what happens to your sugar cravings. Stevia, great herb, is, is about 100 to 300 times, depending on how it's prepared, sweeter than sugar, and yet it doesn't stress the pancreas. It actually stabilizes the pancreas, makes it stronger. You can use it to cook with, you can put drops of it in your drinks, whatever you want to do, remembering how strong it is, but use this as your sugar replacement. Remember we talked about the chemically created artificial sweeteners that damage the, uh, the system of the body, can do eye damage, can damage the pancreas. Stevia would be the thing to use. We'll come on down a little further. We'll get down into the hormonal system. I don't add male-female hormonals. I've got on top of a little stack here, sage. Now, sage really could be used all over the system. It seems to be a general soothing, balancing equalizer for all the hormones. Sage is fantastic. Some personal experience with Sage, a, a client that, that we worked with, 
had a brother who was physically 25 years old, mentally and emotionally, was just going through puberty. So that was beginning to create some major problems. So what was recommended for that person was to try some sage. And by putting that person on sage, achieved hormonal stability, didn't have these uncontrollable situations developing, and they were able to go through that process rather smoothly and without a crisis developing. Sarsaparilla is generally considered the male hormonal related herbal. Now, within the plant kingdom, plants do not contain hormones. Doesn't happen. Only within living meat type organisms are there hormones. Plants have what might be called phyto, phytoestrogen, phytoprogesterone, phyto. What they do is they have active ingredients in them that either increase or stimulate or help your body produce the actual hormone. Some of them act as a sort of a replacement, but not a direct hormonal effect. Plants do not contain hormones. Sarsaparilla is very stabilizing and it seems to affect the production of testosterone. Sometimes we use that in a female formula for some stabilization. I'll go to black cohosh. That's used quite a bit in female formulas. Early puberty problems, teenage acne, menopausal problems, um, difficulty with, with menstruation. Black cohosh would be the thing to use there. Damiana. Damien is very soothing to the male-female system. Uh, used this, some associates have used Damiana quite a bit, especially in fertility work. Damiana increases the production of semen in the male. Damiana increases the size and strength of the male testicles. With internally in the female, it would be doing strengthening and so forth, but the external effect on male is really rather apparent. But it is soothing to both systems, male and female. We have uh, sarsaparilla again. This is a review of sarsaparilla up here. Here we have wild yam. Wild yam would be an excellent herb for balancing female like in menopausal situation. My own personal experience is that when my adrenals get stressed up here, wild yam is the best thing for me. Remember the connection we went through with the adrenals and the male-female glandular system. The wild yam will not only work directly on the gonadal system, but it's going to go back up here and work on the adrenal system and make the entire system stronger. Wild yam is a great herb, and this is not a potato. This is a little, tiny, skinny Mexican wild yam herbal, so we use the root for that. Go back in a quick review here. This is for the gonadal system, male, female. We've got sage, sarsaparilla, damiana, black cohosh, and the wild yam we just finished with. Come back up here to the pancreas area. Cedarberry, stevia, chromium, nopal. Good success with nopal, helping people get off of their insulin needs. Don't forget the oils, rosemary, eucalyptus. Come back up here, get into the adrenals. We have geranium oil. Go to cola is fantastic here. Panathenic acid is the vitamin. It's a B vitamin, generally taken in a complex, but if you've got weak adrenals, you might want to take some panathenic all by itself. We come back up here to the thymus and the immune system, echinacea, cat's claw, Oregon grape. I wrote golden seal up as an anti-infective, not so much as a stimulus for the thymus. We get into the thyroid, we're looking at kelp. Remember black walnut as an alternative. Spirulina for the pituitary and pineal puts out melatonin, and we can have that as a supplement. Remember bugleweed to slow down and calm and soothe an overactive thyroid. Now, this is not meant to be a totally comprehensive list. There, we could spend all day writing things in between here. There's all kinds of other possibilities. This should give you a good working knowledge and things to go with and, and places to look for perhaps other herbs and other uses. And we'll see some of these again in other places as we go back through our systems. Now we appreciate your sharing time with us and taking a look at this information. And we'd like you to take it and share it with other people because if you can give someone the gift of health, you've given them the best thing you can ever possibly give them. So take this information out, share it with people, 
and help them to learn how their bodies work and what they can do to take care of. We'd like to remind you that at the beginning of this presentation, you saw a disclaimer. And we appreciate it if you would understand that this information is just for educational purposes only. It is never meant to take the place of medical treatment or diagnosis. Please keep that in mind as you share it with people. And we do appreciate your sharing this information with people because the greatest gift you can give to someone is their health and their well-being and understanding of themselves. We hope you'll do that.